Disclaimer before we get started, I am not a doctor or a medical professional. This podcast is not meant to give medical advice or education, merely entertainment. If you have a medical question, please ask your doctor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crocheting Through Medical History. My name is Maria, here to crochet, talk about medical history, drinking some really bad coffee. Let me just explain for a moment. So, last week, I uh, was hungry at work, but then I knew at home we had nothing to eat. So, I went to the store after work, um, and I went to Ollie because it was, like, really hot out, and I was, like, tired and wanted to go home and eat, so it was, like, Ollie sounds manageable. So, I went to Ollie. I was getting some groceries. I picked up almond milk because I drink a lot of milk because I drink a lot of coffee. So, I got some almond milk, whatever, got all the groceries, went home yesterday, opened the almond milk, made coffee with it, took it to work, took a sip. It was terrible. It was, like, the worst, the worst, but it was not good. And then I saw I got um, vanilla unsweetened almond milk instead of original unsweetened, so it was really bad. So today, I was like, what I really want to do is go get a pumpkin spice latte somewhere, but that costs money, and I need to use this almond milk, even if it is horrific. So I made my own coffee, as I usually do, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna embrace the vanilla. So what I did, made a latte, milk, and espresso iced, because I almond milk seemed even more awful. Um, and then I was like, okay, embrace the vanilla. I just put in some vanilla extract. Funny story, I did not think about how that is um, all those things I just put together then are things that on their own don't taste good. So now I have an iced latte made with three ingredients that do not taste good. So it's very bitter. Are you gonna join me? I've been blessed. Hi, do you want to say hi? Look, it's Gimli! My little boy. He needs his nails cut. He's a sharp guy. Anyway, TLDR, TLDH, I guess, too long didn't, TLDO, too long didn't listen. Um, I'm drinking really bad coffee and I'm kind of sad about it and I may still get a pumpkin spice latte on my way to work. Okay, bye. We, I need to blow my nose again. Hold on. Let's take a decongestant while we're here. One more time. Hold on. Wait, wait, Ponyo. Here, you wanna say hi? Look. Who's this? What's this? It's a Ponyo? It's a Ponyo? How are you? This is gonna take a minute to melt. Today, we are going to be talking about the gut microbiome. And we're gonna be crocheting my dino boy. We're on to its head, guys. We're so close. I'm not gonna show you till the end as a little bit of like suspense. Cause I know how to keep an audience, am I right? Or you like skip to the end if you wanna look at it. If you're on YouTube, Murray Hegerman, go check me out. Um, yeah, so we're gonna be crocheting this. I should really wait until this melts. Native plug. This stuff is my best friend. I love it so much. I started after last time I was sick. I just took so much like Dayquil. It was ridiculous. Um, so then I just like ordered some decongestant mucus relief. And it's so good because I take like 10 a day when I'm sick. But it like actually helps. So I asked what I was going to record today last night and then I was like oh I don't know and then I still didn't know like 10 minutes ago and then I was just like looking at my list and I picked something and then I like didn't like it so I picked something else and I didn't like that and then I picked this and now we're sticking with it um basically this was not pre-planned no premeditation also I did approximately zero research on arthritis this week which is now like the big end goal it was like, someday I'll do arthritis, and that'll be, like, a cool time. Um, but I did not research that this week. However, that then gave me so much time to crochet. So I'm very excited for when I can do this big reveal for this dino, because he's looking real good. He's looking pretty great. So, <laughs> should I, like, actually get into it? We are reading an article called 
the origins of gut microbiome research in Europe from Escherich to Nissel? Nisley? This was published in 2019 in the Human Microbiome Journal, and it's now on sciencedirect.com. Introduction. Ever since the publication of the first results from the Human Microbiome Project in 2012, the realization that our cells are outnumbered by bacteria has rekindled not only the scientific, but also the popular interest of the microbes that colonize our bodies. Additionally, it has been estimated that the microbiome contributes 2 to 20 million genes to a, the merely 20,000 genes of the human genome. The clinical relevance of the microbiome became apparent in 2013 when they randomized a controlled trial to treat patients with Clostridium difficile infection was stopped due to the far superior results obtained by infusing healthy donor feces compared to the standard treatment with antibiotics. What? Since then, a new era of clinical studies to replace the bad microbes that cohabitate our body with good microbes has rapidly gained traction amongst the medical community and radically changed how we perceive health and disease. In the midst of it all, we are left wondering how much of this is hype or factual and, crucially, if this is new at all. Diet and bowel habits have always held a prominent place in medical practice and in people's perception of health. Traditionally, doctors have relied on fasting, diets, spring waters, and even purgatives to treat multiple conditions. Moreover, the European pharmacopoeia has included the use of excrements from various species of animals as remedies at least up to the 18th century. In Western literature, the discovery of the gut microflora originates around the 1840s, and by the last two decades of the 19th and early 20th century, the study, characterization, and even therapeutic use of protective microbes reached its scientific peak in France and German-speaking Europe. In scientific literature, the terms microbiota and microbiome can be traced back at least to 1927 and 1949, respectively. In Colorado, fecal enemas were successfully used in 1958 to treat four patients with pseudomembranous enterocolitis, C. difficile infection. Intriguingly, despite the success of the early attempts to improve human health by modulating the microbiota, this area of research remained dormant for many decades. In this article, we review the contributions of four European scientists who, motivated by their desire to curb mortality, improve health, and extend the human lifespan, pioneered and put research on gut flora on the map. German and French pediatricians Theodore Escherich and Henry Tizier, 1908 Nobel Prize winner Ilya Mech... Mech... Metznikov, and a German microbiologist, Alfred Nizel. My, my apologies for those pronunciations. 2. Seen microbes. When examining their own watery stools under the microscope, Antony von Leeuwenhoek observed in 1681 more than 1,000 living animalcules. That's so cute! Animalcules! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Two years later, Lee Hoen Wook also <laughs> described the animalcules living in his own teeth. <gasps> hey, we talked about him last week. Okay, that's why he sounded familiar. But none of native plug last week. Go listen to our, our, my episode on cavities or caries. Despite the wide circulation of Leo and Hook's observations, further research on the meaning of these animalcules did not take off until the mid-19th century. One of the first descriptions of gastrointestinal bacteria was provided in 1842 by Edinburgh surgeon John Goodsir, who discovered a microorganism which he named Sarcina ventriculi when he examined the ejected fluid from the stomach of a 19-year-old patient. Goodsir believed that the Sarsini was responsible for his patient's condition and proceeded to its elimination with creosote drops, a substance used as a gastrointestinal antiseptic. 
Goetzer's report faced some resistance. In particular, German pathologist Friedrich Theodor von Friericks considered Goetzer's position irrational, since he believed that the sarcina did not have any influence on digestion and were completely inactive residents of the human body. Indeed, Ferrix was consistent with the interpretation of his own pioneering description of microorganisms in the digestive tract, which he considered harmless commensals. Nonetheless, the debate around the enigmatic presence of microorganisms in the, the human gut had already started. During the second half of the 19th century, a number of scientific publications corroborated the presence of bacteria in the human body. In Britain, Lionel Smith Beale reported in 1867 the presence of microorganisms in the human stomach, intestines, and stools. German botanist Ernst Hallier concluded in 1869 that large numbers of bacteria were regularly found in the feces of healthy men. Similarly, United States Army surgeon J.J. Woodward asserted in 1840 79, that millions of microorganisms contributed to the bulk of normal human feces. Large numbers of microorganisms were also found in the normal feces of breastfed babies by German physician Uffelmann in 1881. The puzzling concept of the human gut floor was imperceptibly being put together. A comprehensive, meticulous work was now needed to consolidate this knowledge. 3. Linking gut bacteria with health and disease, babies, milk, and flora. By the end of the 1880s, the germ theory of disease was widely accepted amongst physicians. The bacteria responsible for cholera, anthrax, and tuberculosis had been identified, and the science was ready to adopt the Henley Co. postulates. At this point, fermentation, putrefaction, and infection were unequivocally linked to microorganisms. However, the role of bacteria observed in the intestinal tract and other areas of the body in healthy subjects was still inconclusive. The main characters of this story are the babies and the pediatricians who worried about their well-being and survival. First and foremost, Theodore S. Skerich, who developed his career initially in Munich and later on at St. Anna's Children's Hospital in Vienna. Eskirik, who had also witnessed and studied the Naples cholera epidemic in 1884, was greatly concerned by the high mortality rates caused by gastrointestinal infections during the first months of life. Eskirik, best known for his discovery of what he called a bacterium coli commune, posthumously named Eskirikii coli, knew firsthand how complex the study of gut flora was. Nevertheless, he recognized its importance and advised against neglecting its study, since for him the microorganisms living in the intestine were crucial to comprehend the physiological and pathophysiological processes of the gut. Iskirik's research culminated in two works which marked a turning point in the understanding of the concept of human flora. Firstly, the 1885 publication of the intestinal bacteria of the neonate and breastfed infant, an article in which he described for the first time the bacterium coli commune, which he observed in large numbers in the feces of healthy babies, and most notably a year later at only 29 years of age, the seminal, the intestinal bacteria of the infant and their relation to the physiology of digestion a comprehensive microbiological study of the feces in infants. In this classical treatise, Eskirik detailed with scientific rigor the bacterial composition of the intestinal tract of infants and the transformation of this flora from birth onwards, the role of these bacteria in the decomposition of foods, and the clinical implications of gut flora. Building on the research undertaken in Munich over the previous decade by Theodor Eskirik, Henry Tizier added at the turn of the century a critical element to Eskirik's studies of babies' stools, the anaerobic culture. Thus, he came to discover in 1899 that most of the intestinal flora of healthy infants was not constituted by the bacterium coli commune as previously thought, but that a newly found bacterium, which based on its shape he named Bacillus bifidus communis, was abundantly found... Remarkably, it's now accepted that the genus 
bifidobacterium, currently one of the most widely used probiotics, is highly abundant in the gut flora of infants until the introduction of solid food. Tazir also noticed that while this microorganism was a very abundant, strict anaerobe in normal feces, it was much harder to find in cases of diarrhea. Subsequent research conducted by Tazir and colleagues confirmed that bacteria such as Enterococcus bacillus coli, bacillus acetoperlactici, and others were able to prevent milk decomposition through the production of lactic acid. Tizier decided to take this research a step further and use some of the good bacteria as therapy. In order to achieve the expected health benefits, Tizier chose the bacillus acetoperlactici, which he knew to be very resistant and to have a strong fermentative power. He administrated one to two teaspoons daily of a pure culture of said bacillus to children with gastrointestinal disease, with the aim to replace the harmful flora with the normal flora of breastfeeding babies. In his clinical observations, Tizier linked the restoration of the normal flora to the definitive recovery of the patients, anticipating the potential applicability of this new therapy. Tizier successfully administered the same treatment to adult patients, albeit in larger doses, stressing that if nothing else, the treatment was completely safe. 4. From auto-intoxication to pre-probiotics of dogs, parrots, and yogurt. My three favorite animals. <laughs> I'm funny. The notion that by entering the blood system, poisons generated in the gastrointestinal tract had a systemic effect was postulated in 1868 by German physician Hermann Senator. During the next decades, the realization that the colonic bacteria produced compounds with toxic activity when injected into animals provided scientific support for this theory, derogating the function of the colon to that of a cesspit. The auto-intoxication theory, which became very popular toward the end of the 19th century, was championed in Paris by Professor of Medicine Charles Jacques Bocard, who argued that the production of intestinal microbes were a constant threat to the body, even stating that the body was under constant threat of poisoning and incessantly attempting suicide by intoxication. Trigger warning suicide if you don't want to hear about it skip ahead like a minute spoiler for criminal minds season like nine i just finished the arc um with spencer and maeve um and that crazy lady that killed her um that thought that like the body she was like when someone commits suicide like bef when they've decided to they're like the cells in their body start to die anyway so that makes like killing themselves easier that that wasn't going anywhere I just like thought of that and I got sad again because I hate that storyline and it sucks and I just <laughs> and I just want Spencer to be happy and then he finally had a girl he liked and then she liked him and then she died and I just think that's really sad anyway I may have cried about that it's okay um <clears throat> Interestingly, the proponents of auto-intoxication had an early intuition of the current well-characterized phenomenon of bacterial translocation and leaky gut, which explains that under certain conditions, colonic bacteria and possibly their metabolic products gain access to the bloodstream with deleterious downstream effects. In fact, it is now estimated that in physiological conditions, approximately 36% of all blood metabolites are released by the intestinal microbiota. However, these metabolites and their specific role in health are only just being uncovered. Auto-intoxication also resonated with Professor Ilya Meknikov, a renowned researcher of the Institute Pasteur known mainly for its work on immunity. We talked about that in the the uh, the penicillin episode, right? Right. Um. Once again, trigger warning. It's good, but like thirty seconds. Meknikov, now in his fifties and a survivor of two suicide attempts, was deeply concerned by the short lifespan of humans and the inordinately length of the human colon. Two phenomena that he believed were physiologically linked. 
to illustrate the evolutionary disadvantage of having a long colon, Meknikov, while delivering his lecture on old age in Paris, addressed a large audience accompanied by a poorly aged 18-year-old dog in a perky 70-year-old parrot, two examples of long and short colons, respectively. Fortunately, Meknikov, unlike some of the proponents of colon resection as a solution to prevent auto-intoxication, also conceived that some remedy could be provided by replacing harmful flora with harmless or beneficial species. Indeed, he hypothesized that if, he, if the poisons generated by undesirable gut bacteria cause the decline of aging, beneficial organisms should also be able to delay the changes associated with old age. The discovery of the Bulgarian bacillus by Bulgarian microbiologist Stamen Grigorov when cultivating yohorth, also known as Casello mleko, literally sour milk, brought from home further fueled his idea. Indeed, Mac Maksnikov attributed the perceived longevity of Bulgarian peasants to the regular consumption of yogurt. Maknikov's endorsement of fermented milk in his book The Prolongation of Life gave birth to the yogurt craze, and he was even accredited to have found a cure for old age. That's really funny. <laughs> Meknikov's reputation soon internationalized the consumption of various forms of fermented milk, such as yogurt and kefir. Tablets containing lactic acid bacteria were soon marketed, and clinicians discussed the therapeutic possibilities of lactic acid bacteria, as illustrated by articles published in the United States and the United Kingdom, which pointed out their use in cases of diarrhea and various other conditions, such as nephritis and arteriosclerosis. Number five, dysentery in the trenches, delivering probiotics in the field. Fun fact, um, my first idea for this um, article read was battlefield, like historical battlefield medical techniques, but I couldn't find a good article about it, so I may have to like actually research that one, which means it'll, it'll be a while, if it happens at all. When, during World War I, the German army was unable to curb deadly dysentery epidemics in the Balkans and Easter Front, medical microbiologist Alfred Nisley had already investigated bacterial antagonism in his laboratory at the Albert Ludwig's University of Friedberg. Interested in the interaction between different bacteria within the host, Nisley had realized that some E. coli strains of the normal intestinal flora impeded the growth of salmonella and other enteropathogens, and categorized these strains antagonistically strong or antagonistically weak. During the summer of 1917, the number of dysentery cases peaked. However, a German corporal who had been deployed in the midst of the epidemic of Dobrudja in the Balkans appeared immune to the disease. Based on his previous experiments, Nisley suspected that the flora of this soldier contained an E. coli strain antagonistically strong against intestinal pathogens. Further microbiological tests of said soldier's stools eventually led to the discovery of a new E. coli strain, later named strain Nisley 1917 which showed marked antagonistic activity against pathogenic enterobacteria. Anticipating its potential to treat dysentery and other intestinal conditions, Nisley cultured this specific strain of E. coli in the laboratory, put them in gelatin... This is British, that's just gelatin. Put them in gelatin capsules and patented it as a therapy with the name Mutaflor, which continues to be used to this day. Indeed, 100 years later, the E. coli Nisley 1917 strain has become a reference strain for genetically engineering bacteria for clinical use. Six conclusions. Early research on the intestinal microbiome dates back to the 1840s. The pivotal work of Theodore Eskerich, Henry Tizier, Ily Meknikov, and Alfred Nisley advanced the scientific foundations and clinical applications of the microorganisms found in the gut microbiome. More than a century later, new technological developments have shed new light on the complexity of the human microbiome and its role in the pathophysiology of many diseases. In view of how this is likely to change how we understand medicine, the contributions of these scientists are all more remark are all the more remarkable and should be acknowledged. We did it. Hmm. 
I'm kind of sleepy. I think it's nap time. Okay, are you ready for the grand reveal of what we have for this night so far? Because I am so excited. Ready? Ready? That's my dinosaur. Look, he's like, he has a body. He has his little color stripes on the back. He has little arms. Wait, ready? This is the best part. His little arms wave. Um, yeah, this is my little guy. This is my little little dino boy. This good little boy. Um, making his head now, and then he needs a tail, and he needs little spikies, and then he's done. I think. I love him. He's just good, but like he looks like a dinosaur now. Like his little body. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, that's what I've been working on. Um, I realized today I got chosen to test a crochet bucket hat, um, Granny Square bucket hat by, I don't remember who was by, someone on Instagram. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Marie Makes Makes and you'll see when I post about it. But I got chosen to test a crochet Granny Square bucket hat. Um, and I have two weeks to finish it now, and I have not started, so I should probably start that soon. Um, yeah, that's about it. I'll keep you posted on that. I will maybe actually research our writer this week. We will see about that. Um, things are, f time's flying. It's almost fall. I'm so excited. Maybe I'll get a pumpkin spice latte today. Maybe I'll make myself wait because I'm a responsible human that can money manage successfully. And yeah, I think that's about it. If you have any topic suggestions or if you have a condition that you'd be willing to talk to me about, comment below or message me on Instagram or whatever. I love to talk to you and hear your suggestions. Uh, follow me on YouTube, Maria Hegerman. Follow me on, I'm on TikTok. Oh my gosh, Instagram, TikTok, and Ribbler at Maria Makes Makes um, for the link to this article as well as the pattern that I'm following. Check the description below. Um, what else? If you want to see more of this little dino that I'm making, I am actually working on a like normal YouTube video about it. Um, so keep your, keep your eyes posted, keep your ears peeled, keep your eyes peeled and your ears open. I'm, you know, fairly close to finishing the dinosaur, which means after I finish it, it'll be another like two months before I edit the video and post it. All that aside though, keep an eye out. Exciting things are coming to YouTube. So... Go give me a subscribe while you can so that you can be notified when that happens. Uh, anyway, rate, review, share with your friends. Thank you for being here. I love you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.